So what can I answer to Thursday's present canal policy? Well, you know. Just I. Can you? Thursday? Dash it all, old man. It's only seven days. Did you say canal? Well, it is your department, isn't it? But I'm told there's one called the Grand Junction or Grand Union or Grand something that goes from town to Birmingham. Why not dig up a bit on that for a start? I say, old boy, but there it is. Oh, damn all canals and all ministers and you too, Clitheroe. Really, old boy, there's no need to take it. Miss Brown, bring me anything we have on canals. Thank you. Mark well this. Daniel Prendergast was diligent. He came, he saw, he considered. However, almost at once, a problem presented itself. Activity, gentlemen. Distinct signs of activity. But Prendergast was a man who relied not only upon his eyes, where necessary, he did not scruple to address the common folk for information. And much may often be gained in this way. That of the Bonavon Canal appears to have been taken over by the National Trust. It is being repaired by voluntary labor, presumably too late to stop this. There was no hint then of the heresy that was to follow. He inspected the great flight of locks that carries the Grand Union Canal over Hatton Hill. He forced himself through half-forgotten horse paths to explore the tunnels and tucking so prodigally sprinkled over the countryside by our forefathers. No stone unturned, though they were always replaced exactly as he found them. At remote canal side villages, he questioned the lot keepers and compiled statistics. Come up these locks with the horses, throw the boat up to you, and then tie up at night, stable the horses in there. The next morning they would go in, fetch the horses out, and take the boats up as far as the tunnel end, and wait there until the tug got up to them. And sometimes there'd be such many as 15, 16, and I have no 18 to tow through with that one steam tug. And had a very nice, comfortable way of working, far different than it is today. Pausing, he managed to collect the statutory data for his expense account. Prendergast continued his task. Now, some observers have said that it was at this point that Samuel Prendergast's devotion to the ministry began to waver. They maintained that he should never have accepted an invitation to inspect the waterway by boat. Well, I do not entirely accept this. In my opinion, where error crept in was in accepting private hospitality. Once allow yourself to hesitate, gentlemen, and the pit yawns before you. The unfortunate fellow had started upon the slippery slope that forever separates us from them but he was not yet totally lost.
He still tried to turn from temptation to contemplate the decent calm of a properly abandoned waterway. He could still weigh, assess, itemize, investigate. He was still capable of deploring the uncalled for public hazard of a vast cast iron bridge full of water. time went by, Samuel Prendergast allowed himself to be seduced from the strict objectivity towards which all our efforts here at the Ministry are directed. He began to be personally involved in what he was doing, an effort so basic that had decidedly been assumed until then to be completely unknown in our department. Now here we see the man in an advanced stage, still however clinging to a vestige of decency, but Feel yourself for the moment of shame. No, 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 gentlemen, do not cover your eyes. Look, he smiles. There's no hope. It ails me. Pleasure, though. I am informed they are called by the unthinking. He noted the unconstructively idle, the rootless flotsam of the populace, waterborne nomads who serve no public purpose, idly moving bats and forth like cattle. commercial boats. thing in any other circumstance. But here the wretched man had already formulated the detestable idea that some end product was to emerge. Something other, of course, than a neatly docketed file to join those other files that lie in beautifully ordered rows upon our shelves. Prendercast had become no better than a vulgar businessman. He wanted to get things done. Heresy was in full control of the man. Faced with unmistakable evidence of undesirable activity, Prendergast, by now blind to all reason, scribbled and scribbled. I knew 
that it was the end of the road for Samuel Prendergast. I had to fall back upon a time-honored formula for the minister. It sounded well enough, I think. Richard says with pride that canals were an embarrassing legacy from the past. Little better in most cases than open drains, they offered only a slender prospect of remunerative utilization and were used merely as a convenient retreat by some of the less desirable sections of the community. Despite the arguments put forward by a small but noisy group, he could find no evidence of amenity value to the country as a whole. Nevertheless, he was assured that the cost of filling them in and piping the water was not economically justifiable, at least for the duration of the present period of this inflation. The status quo should therefore be maintained until such time as the government should decide to appoint a new royal commission to reconsider the whole question. And that is the end of yet. Alas, poor Samuel Prendergast, he had gone naked. I'm told that he's still alive, if to be one of them, to be alive. But he is forever dead to us here at public apathy.